So uh, when I was 10, I noticed a book called Unfurling Cables, and it was in the public library shelf. Um, it was a Japanese translation, and um, I don't know what it was about, but um, the back of the book was kind of inviting me to read it. So I read it, and I was really fascinated by what I read. Um, at the time, I was somebody who was reading a lot of books. I was a bookworm, but my the books I read was somewhat more kind of a, a crime fiction like or you know Sherlock Holmes and, or other world literature uh, Tolstoy and you know uh, Stendhal and all these things uh, at the time in Japan uh, it was customary for a uh, schoolboy to read all these because it, there was a canon of world literature ready for you and it came with really wonderful volumes and so I was exposed to the, all these things, but somehow I didn't really come across uh, of Green Gables until that day. And I was 10, and I had this self-perception that I was a boy. And, you know, I was studying butterflies, and I was trying to be athletic, although I didn't really succeed. And so it... It, you know, probably the perception of uh, William Gables was that it was a gaudy book. Um, it was not something that a boy would read, and I might have had that prejudice. But uh, anyway, there was something about the book that enticed me. So I took it up and I started reading, and um, I was fascinated. So I read all the uh, Green Gables series written by Roshi Mode Mongomi. And at the time, I never went out of Japan. Uh, I was just confined to this island nation. And I didn't know any external world. And I didn't really read English or listen to it, except for some rare occasions when I went to see Chichi uh, Chichi Bam Bam, for example or Mary Poppins, or uh, Sound of Music. And all these were subtitles. So I was exposed to some English uh, culture, my fear already. But otherwise, I didn't really have any opportunity to interact with the English language in general. And I have to stop here for a sec and probably presume later. So I am back on the street in Shinjuku area and uh, so when I uh, read Anvogin Gables, it was an eye-opener, it was something that I didn't expect, it was a serendipity and it took many many years for me to realize what I was just exposed. Uh, you know, I finished the Anvogin Gables series in Japanese uh, uh, by a really wonderful translation by Hanako Murauka and uh, actually her life was made into a drama series from the public broadcaster NHK and the strange twist of the matter was that I actually appeared on the last three episodes of this uh, drama series Hanako to Am, Hanako and Am uh, which of course refers to Hanako Muraoka, who was a translator and um, of Green Gables um, and so I had some really interesting episode of, of my life uh, I was playing the part of uh, of the uh, president of a publishing house which I actually asked Hanako Muraoka, Hanako Muraoka to uh, translate the work and um, of Green Gables was translated as uh, Kageno An, red-headed An, which was actually proposed by the president of the publishing company. But uh, for the first time, for, uh, at the beginning, uh, Hanako Murauka didn't like the title. But the title somehow stuck 
uh, with uh, the public's imagination, and they're still here in this country. And our green gave shoes is actually very popular among Japanese、uh, people for some reason or another. And that's probably the reason why I came across it、uh, quite, in a quite random manner on that fateful day when I was 10 years old. Anyway, so I read all、uh, shoes. About Hanako Murauka's translation. And when I was 15, I started to read the work in English.、Um, I vaguely remember when you know, I first read Of Green Gables. It was kind of difficult, but at the same time, since I have read, I've read the Japanese translation, I had some you know, ladder to climb on. So that was helpful.、Uh, so, you know. I started to learn English at the age of 12, and I started to read Arnold w i n g e r b e r g when I was 15. So, you know, <laughs> quite an interesting timeline for me personally. Anyway, what was so special about Arnold w i n g e r b e r g Well, it is a story of serendipity, isn't it? I mean, Aunt Shirley was raised in an orphanage, and, you know, when Maria and Matthew. To unmarried brothers and sisters.、Uh, they were searching for a boy to help them with、uh, you know, chores at the farmland.、Uh, the message got mixed up, and this girl was sent to them to Prince Edward Island. And at first, Maria, who is always practical,、uh, didn't ha- like the idea of. Adopting Anne, but、uh, Matthew, the ever so gentle, kind, you know, good natured person,、uh, was taken by Anne Shirley, and he was the one who proposed to adopt Anne Shirley. And so there was this interesting conversation between the brother and sister. But finally,、uh, Anne Shirley was,、uh, you know, destined to stay at Green Gables, and, you know, This is a really wonderful story of serendipity. Serendipity is when you have a quite unexpected event coming to your life, and at first you are surprised, but you accept it. And by accepting this、uh, unexpected element into your life,、uh, you actually become richer and more robust and a happier person. And you know, so this is the basic start point, if you like, of the now famous juvenile novel.、Uh, in life, you sometimes encounter something new, something unexpected, and you might reject it at first hand because of your you know, anxieties, because of your value systems, and because of the very fact that it was unplanned. But if you embrace it, if you embrace what has come your way, probably your life will become a fuller, richer, happier one. And,、uh, you know, I quite remember, vividly remember what Matthew Cuthbert said when she, he made up his mind to accept Anne Shirley.、Uh, he said, you know,、uh, instead of asking, What this child can do for us, let us ask what we can do for her. That's the gist of it. And I think that's a really wonderful、uh, humanistic、uh, attitude on the part of、uh, Matthew.、Um, because, you know,、um, until that time, all the brother and sister w a s concerned was you know, how, how, where, how, how uh, uh, You know, young hands, a pair of young hands could help them with the chores of、uh, the farmland. But, you know, then, a n s h a r l y came along, and he was a very unique child. I'll be coming back, coming to that soon.、Uh, but he was, she was a really, really, you know, non typical child and full of imagination. And at first,、uh, Matthew Cosbert was surprised, and Maria was surprised. Rachel Lind was surprised. But you know, gradually, people 
started to appreciate the unique personality of Anne Shell. And that process itself is really、uh, wonderful. I think it's a really great model for,、uh, well, for the lack of better words, epiphany. And s h e l l y was an epiphany for the people she encountered, and you know, in which something deep, deeply hidden uh, in uh, each of us is revealed. And you know, something that you have forgotten when you become adult and when you become practical and when you go about your business、um, in life, and、uh, when you are bound by that. Powers of、uh, customs, you forget something that is very important, but something deeply hidden in humanity. And u n s u r e l y uncovers that deeply hidden thing. So that was the epiphany for Maria and Matthew and Ray Julian and many other people eventually.、Uh, I'm actually coming to a publisher where I am going to have a、uh, Public dialogue、uh, to be sh-、uh, taken、uh, in video and you know, used for some purposes. So I, I think I need to stop here and per- resume later. So see you along. So I am on, back on the street again after the video shooting、uh, in the publishing house. And、uh, so I was saying,、uh, encountering. On Green Game, one of Green Gables was a serendipity for me. And the story itself、uh, depicts serendipity of the highest kind. So, in your life,、uh, I think it is sometimes difficult to accept what came your way because、uh, it can be probably different from what you hold as your value systems. So,、um, you know, if you have the courage to accept Whatever it might come your way, probably you can be、uh, a different person, like, just like Matthew and Marilla、uh, was, were transformed by the arrival of, of Anne of、um, Shirley. You know, the way、uh, Anne Shirley changed the lives of these old, cup,、uh, these peop- old people is quite interesting.、Uh, she was full of imagination. And、imagination has the power to change the reality.、Uh, because Anne s h e l l y was、uh, raised in an orphanage, she was materialistically not so enriched.、Uh, Anne s h e l l y didn't have a privileged、uh, upbringing. Uh, but uh, she, Anne s h e l l y argumented that with her imaginative power. And im- imagination can go. A very long way、uh, if you have the will to apply it. And I, I think this is a lesson for many people.、Uh, today we are living in a world where there are many asymmetries between the conditions of life for many people. And you know, some people are privileged and some people are not so privileged. But、uh, if you have the will and if you have the imagination, then you can go beyond your、uh, environment. Um, I, I think this is a really wonderful message.、Uh, when I was you know, exposed to a r m of Green Gables, I was in Japan, and at the time, globalization didn't ha- happen yet, and you know, we didn't have the internet. So the cultures that I was exposed to were limited、um, in that you know, it was Japanese, of course, and it was constrained by Japanese values. And, You know, although I was not aware at the time, I think I was you know, a different person then.、Uh, of course, I cannot say I am perfect or you know,、uh, rounded now, but、um, at the time when I read o u r Green Gables, without knowing it, I, I think I was concerned by my local culture. And I.、Uh, I suspect that it is the case for many people, actually. No matter where you have come from,、uh, you are always constrained by your local culture. And that is something you start with. And it's not 
such a bad thing actually uh, if you start from your local culture you can always make it uh, your secure place so for me I think that Japanese culture was my secure place but our green gives helped enlarge it in some really significant ways uh, I was very impressed by the, for example by the way uh, theater education was incorporated in the story uh, at that time uh, theater education or drama education uh, were not no I mean uh, of, we probably played performed some music and some uh, play uh, from time to time but only on a really fragmented basis we didn't have the opportunity to you know give free expression to our individuality through school performances uh, we didn't have the time to read out one's poem uh, in front of the audience uh, these things were not in the Japanese educational system but when you read our game games it was through of theater education drama education and uh, recited her poems and, and uh, performed some roles in praise and these were quite different from what the kind of education that I received in this country of course Japanese education has its merits and I'm thankful for that but at the same time by reading out of the game games without knowing it I was exposed to somebody just sneezed uh, <laughs> and that was somebody from abroad and I think he also probably had hay fever uh, <laughs> So, uh, wow, interesting. Uh, the world is a theater. Uh, so that was one thing, and you know, so this uh, element of drama education, theater education. Another thing is, um, you know, what uh, Marira, Matthew, and other people uh, valued more than anything else. And, you know, I, I think there was this element of human-centered um, worldview, um, humanism, which probably isn't here to this day uh, in this country. Of course, Japan has its version of humanism, but it's a bit different from the way it is treated uh, in the West. And, you know, to this day, for example, when it comes to uh, human rights, uh, freedom of speech, uh, equality, respecting one's individuality. I think uh, Japan still has a long, long way to go. And I, I'm not saying that the Western values are perfect, but it's certainly different. And it's certainly full of things that could inspire us, that we could learn from. And um, I, the Aung Green Gables, I think, was through of these values. Uh, for example, uh, there was this element of charity. Uh, you know, at the church, uh, people were doing things for the less privileged. And so there was this idea to help people uh, out when they were in uh, difficulties. And this idea is, uh, uh, you know, probably something that is um, present in the Western culture today, um, which might be present in Japan too, in some form or another. But uh, you know the context in which these uh, altruistic activities are embedded are different. So that was something really interesting for me at the time. I'm coming to a, a subway station now, so I'm. We'll stop here again and pr probably pr resume this recording later. So I am in Hibiya Park now. Uh, I have you know, uh, trans been transported by uh, the subway and now I'm walking in the Hibiya Park. It's a really wonderful park. It feels like springtime today. It is springtime, uh, but the chill blossoms 
are not blooming yet. So this is an important distinction. I think officially, at least uh, in areas around Tokyo, spring comes when the cherry blossoms bloom. That's official. That is not negotiable. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, so I learned a lot from our green cables, and you know, I really loved the whole series. Um, you know, um, of Avonlea, uh, of the Island Island House of Dreams, and uh, uh, Windy Willows. I particularly liked uh, Windy Willows. Um, this is this, uh, you know, illustrates how Anshari uh, took up boarding at uh, you know a place where uh, there's this woman called Rebecca Du, and Rebecca Du was a really delightful person. And you know, I, I understand there are two versions of it. Actually, um, on Windy Willows and on Windy Poplars and. For some reason, um, I preferred on uh, windy willows. Uh, this metaphor of a willow tree, uh, you know, in the wind and beside a house, uh, it's so you know charming and so it has such an air to that. So I really loved on uh, windy willows, and so I loved all of these books. But uh, you know, after I reread it and reread it during my lifetime. Um, you know, as I said, um, I read Avogin uh, Gavis for the first time in English in I think I was 15 and then I started to re read the rest of the works and and then I went on to read the Emily series, Emily of New Moon and so on. Yeah, actually, I was a really great Roshi Modo Mongomi fan, I should say. Uh, I read Jan series and I read the autobiography, The Alpine Path, and so I read probably uh, most of the available Yoshimoto Montgomery books. But after all that journey, um, I probably came back to this idea that um, it's all about Angle of Green Games after all. Because crucially, when Lucy Maud Montgomery wrote Arm of Green Gables, she didn't expect the work to be so successful that uh, sequels would be required from the uh, market. And, you know, and so Arm of Green Gables was actually a self-contained book in conception and in execution, I think. So if you read Arm of Green Gables as a standalone book, uh, separate from the sequels and appreciate it as it is, I think it's really brilliant because it describes the process of opening up and close, then closing in of Anne Shirley's dreams and um, how she um, abandons her ambitions for greater things. Well, when I say greater things, uh, I'm not saying in terms of hierarchy. I mean, uh, you know, in life, you sometimes aspire to be something. Uh, you know, there are times when you're young, uh, your dreams kind of mushroom to really, really great dimensions, and you try to, you know, kind of get free from the local bounds and, you know, the sky's the limit, and you want to expand yourself, expand your ego to uh, greater space. That happens on Shari too, so I re quite re vividly remember when she uh, attended the gala and she, uh, you know, recited. I, I don't actually recall the details, but there was this writer from America. And she met her and, and Shari's ambition uh, seems to be boundless at the time. But then uh, Matthew Casbot passes away and Maria Casbot is left alone, and there should be somebody who uh, looks after her. And then this, yeah, well, I was actually leaving a really important part of this story, Gilbert Price, and, you know, uh, so Gilbert actually uh, makes friends with Gilbert Price because she, he has abandoned his position, promised position at the Avonlea. 
school. Uh, so, you know, everything happens so rapidly. And uh, when you brought very kindly um, and very gently uh, allow Sunshine to take the position so that she could remain at Alan Green Gables with Maria Cuthbert, you know, uh, uh, this star closes in, uh, you know, uh, uh, just as shockingly and rapidly as it expanded with her youth. And this is, that was shocking, but also realistic and ultimately very satisfying and moving. You know, in life, uh, you know, you have ambitions and you, your dreams, you know, mushroom out of proportions. But then, uh, as you grow, you realize that probably it's not for you. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter so much. Uh, now that you have the mantra of people who tell you that you need to be pursuing your big goals and, you know, um, you need to be somebody who is larger than life and so on. And uh, that happens, happened to Anshari too. But uh, at the end of the uh, of Green Gables, um, you know, Anshari goes back to her original self. And through that process, she finds happiness. So I think Anne of Green Gables is ultimately a book about finding your happiness. And that happiness doesn't necessarily mean an endless pursuit of dreams. Uh, I'm not saying that pursuing your dreams is a bad thing. It's a good thing. But, you know, the world is full of failure stories rather than success stories. We focus too much on success stories and lose universality in them. Because it's not everybody that succeeds. At least uh, if you measure success by worldly uh, you know, um, um, scales, uh, if you compete in the tennis tournament, there has been recently a wonderful documentary, so I hear, on Netflix about professional uh, tennis players and how they go about the tour of competing with each other and only, of course, only one of them can win in the match so that uh, everyone else will be unhappy, which is ridiculous because if you make it to the top 100, for example, in any genre, uh, you'll be happy, you'll be extremely happy if you make it to the top 100 architects, for example, you'll be extremely happy and comfortably well off. The same goes for writers, musicians, and so on. But for tennis pro- professional tennis players, for one reason or another, the glory is bestowed upon only at the very top. So the other players would feel left out. And that is a terrible business in terms of mental health, uh, which I think is a serious issue, ultimately. So, you know, we have all these repeating patterns where uh, people who are supposed to be at the top um, are glorified and while others suffer and rot in misery. So that shouldn't be the uh, uh, fate of young people and young aspiring people. When they aspire to be somebody, they shouldn't be aspiring to be a top tennis pro or something equivalent to that because that is a fundamentally flawed competition structure. And you know, I'm kind of probably, uh, you know, being disrupted. I'm right now, I'm in, the, in front of the TVM town and this is a theater district and there are some cinemas and uh, Takarazuka Tokyo is here. Takarazuka is all female review. And uh, it's a tradition, uh, quite interesting tradition maybe. I have some time to talk about it on another occasion. And um, actually I am very close to where I finished in the Tokyo Marathon uh, several days ago, last Sunday. So my legs are back to normal. So I will be running soon. Uh, I am in the front of the Lacoste shop. I never go 
shopping, almost never go for shopping for clothes. I wear the same clothes all the time, so I'm not a fashionista. Anyway, uh, so yeah, so you know, at the end of Green Gables, there is this closing in of Horizon Vista, which I think is wonderful. Uh, you know, um, when you really think about it, each of us is entitled to a unique way of life, and you know, it doesn't really, it, it, it doesn't really mean that you need to compete and win. That is a rather ridiculous idea. Uh, well, the only uh, thing that uh, probably needs to be competing and win is artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, they would be well advised to compete and win, and because they are machines and they can do that. But we are not here to compete. So, you know, of course, I'm going to say it's not about competition, but uh, the way Lucy Mold Mongoli uh, depicts how the horizon of our shallow finally shrinks so that she would be staying in Avonli Elementary School as a teacher and stays with uh, Mario Kaisepart uh, while uh, nurturing her friendship with Gilbert Bryce. I think it's brilliant and the novel could have ended there. Of course we know the sequels and we have sequels so it's useful to read them. And it's also inspiring to read them, but it's coming from the same Lucy Montgomery, the great novelist. But um, you know, *Anne of Green Gables* could be also read by itself, and it is a great story of uh, you know serendipity, as I said, accepting one's uh, destiny, and it's a really great story of epiphany and uh, accepting one's limitations. All these things make this novel really wonderful. And I was so lucky to come across, to have come across with, with it. Uh, when I was uh, 10 years old, I read it in Japanese and then in English in, when I was 15. So, uh, interesting twist. Uh, I, so I entered into an essay writing contest when I was 15 and the prize was a trip to Canada. Uh, that trip, I won the essay contest by the way, uh, out of 1,000, 2,000 contestants, so I was good at writing essays at the time. And um, I went to Canada, but I didn't realize that Canada is a vast country and, you know, uh, I went to Vancouver, which was really great. And um, so Vancouver was the first city I set my feet on. And it was an inspiration that belongs to another episode, maybe. And then I, I actually went to Prince Edward Island twice. Um, you know, and when I visited the island, um, you know, I, I liked it quite apart from the fact that it's the you know, place where our Green Gables was conceived. It's quite apart from that literary merit. I think there are wonderful things about Prince Edward Island. Uh, the lobsters were brilliant. I took a bike, bicycle ride from Cavendish, that's where the Green Gables house is, to North Lastico, and um, that seaside road was really memorable and I still remember vividly how it was to ride a bicycle, a rented bicycle along the road and that was a really wonderful memory for me. So I think Arm Green Gables transformed my life in so many ways. Uh, I'm actually coming to a place where I'll be having lunch with somebody from the UK uh, representing the boarding schools and a lady who is coordinating so I need to be stopping so probably it's time to summarize what I have been saying. Uh, life is full of opportunities 
and the greatest of them all is serendipity, I think. And when you encounter something unexpected and embrace it and make it your destiny, then you have the greatest epiphany of your life. And our Green Gables taught me how to appreciate these very uh, miraculous and uh, almost random uh, encounters with something or somebody you didn't expect. So that put me on a journey, quite interesting journey, which I still uh, pursue to this day. And I'm grateful for Angling Gables for teaching me how to appreciate uh, those um, unexpected gifts of life. So with that thought, I finish and thank you for listening for, to this episode of uh, Chemical Street Brain Radio.